Hello, I'm Victor Strandberg, here for one last lecture on T.S. Eliot. In this session, we won't be looking at his poetry, but instead at his literary and cultural criticism as a way of concluding this course. In order to benefit from this lecture, you will need to look at these six pages of segments from Eliot's writings that I have uh, included as a document with this lecture. And if you have looked at this material, then we can scan it together and I will offer a commentary. The first thing you see in page one of this document is the American. That is to say the question of what uh, national identity T.S. Eliot would claim. And I have two comments from his writings on that point. First, he says, our, that is the Eliot's America, came to an end in 1829 when Andrew Jackson was elected president. Well, this sounds very much like T.S. Eliot, the expatriate Englishman. Eliot did in fact become an English citizen about the time that he was baptized into the Church of England in 1927. And he lived most of his life in England and uh, apparently chose that identity uh, over the identity he was born to. On the other hand, item B under this heading, the American, tells us something to the contrary. Uh, and this is Eliot claiming that my poetry obviously has more in common with my distinguished contemporaries in America than with anything written in my generation in England. In its sources, in its emotional springs, it comes from America. So I think we'd have to say that as a poet, T.S. Eliot was an American poet, according to his own testimony. Uh, what really matters is the first 20 years of a person's life to form his most profound, his deepest instincts, his sense of identity. And later when he became an Englishman, I think that was more his social identity. Part two of this document takes up his very celebrated statement, I have become an Anglo-Catholic in religion, a classicist in literature, and a royalist in politics, as ultra-conservative as a man can be, according to that statement. Uh, this statement cited from his preface to a volume called For Sir Launcelot Andrews, a churchman back in Shakespeare's time who helped put together the King James Bible. Well, let's uh, see what those terms mean. We can dismiss the royalist in politics, uh, which apparently Eliot did actually believe. He was a monarchist, uh, though not uh, in, you might say, the Henry VIII mode. First, the classicist in literature, what does it mean? I think he told us quite a lot in his most famous essay, Tradition and the Individual Talent, dated in 1919. Between Prufrock around 1910 and The Wasteland in 1922, Eliot did a lot of thinking about the nature of literature and particularly of modern literature. And though he was considered a revolutionary in his poetic practice, he insisted that he was a practitioner of a classicist standard. So in this essay that I just cited, he says tradition involves, in the first place, the historical sense, a sense that is not only of the presence, excuse me, of the pastness of the past, but of its presence. So a man writes then not only with his own generation in his bones, but a feeling that the whole of the literature of Europe from Homer and within it, the whole of the literature of his own country, all of that has a simultaneous existence and a simultaneous order. It's all present now. It's available now. It affects us all now. 
No poet, no artist of any art has his complete meaning alone. You must set him among the dead. And then I think the most crucial part of this essay is what comes next. What happens when a new work of art is created is something simultaneously to all the works of art that preceded it. The existing monuments form an ideal order among themselves at any moment, which is modified by the introduction of the new, the really new uh, work of art among them. The existing order is complete before the new work arrives, but when that new work arrives, the whole existing order must be if ever so slightly altered. So the new work of art then changes what's there from the past. What he means, of course, is that our perspective toward the past changes when the really new work of art joins the house of literature. And I think we could think of a few instances in Eliot himself uh, for example, because of Eliot's literary criticism on Shakespeare, and because perhaps in part of his use of Shakespeare in his own poetry, citing Shakespeare and Prufrock in The Wasteland and in other works, or perhaps because of his use of classical antiquity, uh, his uh, play, for example, The Family Reunion, harking back to Aeschylus, and the Oresteian trilogy, matricide, and so forth. Uh, because of all that, the arrival of T.S. Eliot into the house of modern literature changes what is already there, what has been there for hundreds or thousands of years, changes our view of it, our understanding of it. That is what he means by being a classicist. The presence of the past and the mutual influence of the present and the past on each other. The classicism then is anti-provincial as regards time, present and past. Classicism also is anti-provincial when it comes to place. And item two on this, under this heading, the classicist in literature, says we are all so far as we inherit the civilization of Europe, and America certainly is included there, we are all still citizens of the Roman Empire. Uh, what he means here is that after the political Roman Empire collapsed, uh, it nonetheless continued in the form of the Christian Church, which occupied the territory of the Roman Empire and then through the conquests of the European empires in the Americas, in Africa and Asia, uh, Europe extended its civilization around the world. And we are all still citizens of that fact, dating back to ancient Rome, and particularly in Eliot's view, to the Christian takeover of the Roman Empire, which continued after the disappearance of the emperors and their kind. Eliot reaches beyond Europe in the next segment, item three, the classicist in literature, when he says the Bhagavad Gita is the next greatest philosophical poem to the divine comedy within my experience. So yes, he will reach out and assimilate Hindu literature Buddhist thought into his work. This is what it means to be a classicist. Uh, his sidekick Ezra Pound did something similar when he reached out to ancient China in uh, his volume called Cathay, C-A-T-H-A-Y, uh, his word for ancient China. <clears throat> Item four is a, uh, under this uh, checklist, the classicist in literature. Um, is somewhat controversial. He insists that classicism implies an anti-romantic suppression of the ego. Uh, Wordsworth, that great romantic poet, was famously called the egotistical sublime. 
by John Keats. Well, Eliot, who sometimes is thought to have been egotistical, insists quite the contrary, that the classicist sensibility requires. He says, the progress of an artist is a continual self-sacrifice, an extinction of personality. Poetry is not a turning loose of emotion, but an escape from emotion, not the expression of personality, but an escape from personality. Now, Eliot, I think, changed his view in his later poetry. It's very obvious after his conversion that the narrator of Ash Wednesday or of Four Quartets is T.S. Eliot. The resemblance, at least, is so great between Eliot and his speaker that any meaningful distinction seems to disappear. Nonetheless, in his earlier writings, uh, he did take care to hide his personal identity behind his various personae, Prufrock or Theresius, uh, or other speakers in his poems. Point five, under the classicist in literature, declares that classicism indicates a unified sensibility. Now, what he means here is something similar to what Ezra Pound declared when he says an image transmits a complex of intellect and emotion in an instant of time. That is to say, a unified sensibility appeals both to intellect and emotion simultaneously. Now, Eliot felt that the unified sensibility had become dissociated uh, around the time of Milton's great uh, poems in the later 17th century, when uh, we had an emphasis on intellect, on the age of reason, as we went on into the 18th century, and later that was followed by a reaction, uh, an emphasis on emotion or feeling on the part of the Romantic poets. And Eliot felt that the best poetry uh, was that that preceded this dissociation of sensibility. Uh, that is to say, back in the time of Shakespeare and John Donne, when their writings appealed both to intellect and emotion very powerfully and simultaneously. His job then as a modern poet is to reunify uh, the sensibility of his reading audience. And uh, let's see what he says under this heading in his essay called The Metaphysical Poets, another very important essay dated in 1921. <clears throat> The poets of the 17th century, he says, thinking of Dunn and Shakespeare and their type, uh, these successes of the dramatists of the 16th possessed a mechanism of sensibility that could devour any kind of experience. But in the 17th century later, in the 17th century, a dissociation of sensibility set in from which we have never recovered, he said back in, as I say, around 1920. And he blamed the two most powerful poets of the 17th century, Milton and Dryden, for producing this dissociation between intellect and emotion. While the language became more refined, and certainly it was in Milton, the feeling became more crude. Um, let's move on now to part B of this document. Eliot declared himself to be a classicist in literature and an Anglo-Catholic in religion. And so part B takes up Eliot as a Christian poet. And here I think we can see ample evidence that after his conversion, dated 1927 when he was baptized, virtually everything he wrote had the purpose of propagating the Christian faith. That certainly comes through in his literary and cultural criticism. 
Now, the essay I'm quoting here is called Thoughts After Lambeth, dated 1931, a year after Ash Wednesday. Lambeth refers to an area of London where the bishop, or I should say the Archbishop of Canterbury, the leader of the Church of England, held his residence. And they had a conference there um, concerning Christian affairs in England. And uh, Eliot, who attended the conference, then wrote this essay. 1931, this is uh, two years before the rise of Adolf Hitler and the Nazis in Germany. The world is trying the experiment of attempting to form a civilized but non-Christian mentality. The experiment will fail, but we must be very patient awaiting its collapse, meanwhile redeeming the time, so that the faith may be preserved alive through the dark ages before us to renew and rebuild civilization and save the world from suicide. Eight years later, after the rise of Hitler and the Nazis, and as the storm clouds of World War II were about to uh, break loose with the greatest war in history, Eliot published an essay called The Idea of a Christian Society. His point here, I think, was that in a number of ways, the fascist or Bolshevik societies and the English or American resembled each other. Certainly the British had created the world's greatest empire at that time, geographically speaking, and the Bolsheviks or the Nazis, the fascists in Italy, they were all trying to do the same thing as the British to extend an empire. So what's the difference between them? In Eliot's view, the difference was that one side of this equation was Christian, the other, certainly when it comes to Bolshevism, uh, expressly atheist, and when it comes to the Nazis and fascists in their behavior, uh, unchristian or anti-Christian. So Eliot here now says, in 1939, the idea of a Christian society, the only hopeful course for a society which would thrive and continue its creative activity in the arts of civilization is to become Christian. That prospect involves discipline, inconvenience, and discomfort, but here is hereafter, the alternative to hell is purgatory. Um, Eliot picked up a lot of his thinking from Dante, no doubt about it. And there was something comforting about the idea of purgatory, of suffering that refines, that leads to uh, spiritual progress. In uh, the middle of those years, between 1931 and 1939, that is, in 1935, Eliot published an essay called Religion and Literature. And I think this is quite significant for what he says about the necessity of the Christian faith to literature. He begins by saying literary criticism should be completed from a def definite ethical and theological standpoint. The greatness of literature cannot be determined solely by literary standards. What I do wish to affirm is that the whole of modern literature is corrupted by what I call secularism, that it is simply unaware of, simply cannot stand the meaning of, the primacy of the supernatural over the natural life. Well, there's a trumpet blast of T.S. Eliot's decision to believe in the supernatural as his answer to the problem of naturalism that so haunted and so dominated his earlier career. He insists that we must believe in the supernatural, that the whole of modern literature is corrupted for its lack of that belief in the supernatural. He goes on to offer a couple of examples of writers who, like himself, had passed through the dark night of the soul, and finally, after a long purgatorial spiritual struggle, 
found belief. The first of these is the great scientific genius Pascal, the author of the Pensées uh, that most of us have at least heard of. And uh, in reviewing the Pensées of Pascal in 1931, Eliot wrote the following. Pascal's intellectual passion for truth, and here we mean scientific truth initially in Pascal's case, two centuries before Eliot. Pascal's intellectual passion for truth was reinforced by his passionate dissatisfaction with human life unless a spiritual explanation could be found. And Pascal is in the Pensees facing unflinchingly the demon of doubt, which is inseparable from the spirit of belief. His despair, his disillusion, are essential moments in the progress of the intellectual soul. The analog of the drought, the dark night, which is an essential stage in the progress of the Christian mystic. I, have no, I know of no religious writer more pertinent to our time. The other writer that he cites is Tennyson and his great Victorian poem, In Memoriam, dated 1850. In Memoriam, he says, can justly be called a religious poem. It's not religious because of the quality of its faith, but because of the quality of its doubt. Its faith is a poor thing, but its doubt is a very intense experience. In Memoriam is a poem of despair, but of despair of a religious kind. Uh, you can see how closely T.S. Eliot is seeing his own spiritual past in the progress of these other artists. We could add a third uh, poet that he describes as having a similar path. That is Baudelaire, the French author of Fleur du Mal that Eliot quoted in The Wasteland and elsewhere. Now Baudelaire tried to express blasphemy against God. Uh, he, uh, like so many French writers of his type, uh, tried his best to be a, a bad boy, you might say, to express wicked thoughts. Nonetheless, according to Eliot, Baudelaire is essentially Christian. Genuine blasphemy, saying wicked things about God, is as impossible to the complete atheist as to the perfect Christian. Blasphemy, then, he says, is a way of affirming belief. What is significant about Baudelaire is his theological innocence. He is discovering Christianity for himself, just like T.S. Eliot, who felt that he had never had any contact with Christianity until after his experience through the wasteland. He had been brought up as a Unitarian, but that, in his opinion, was not a Christian religion. So Baudelaire and T.S. Eliot then, both figures of theological innocence in Eliot's view, initially, who discovered Christianity for themselves, not assuming it as a fashion or weighing social or political reasons. Baudelaire's business was not to practice Christianity, but what was much more important for his time, to assert its necessity. The final comment that I've listed under Eliot, the Christian poet, has to do with the most important of all virtues, according to Eliot. Humility is the most difficult of all virtues to achieve. Nothing dies harder than the desire to think well of oneself. And remember Eliot struggling through Ash Wednesday, a trying to achieve humility, doing his best at it. Now, I sum up these thoughts with the term the Christian classicist. I am a classicist in literature and an Anglo-Catholic in religion. Quoting, the ultimate purpose of art. As a Christian classicist, Eliot says, it is a function of all art to give us some perception of an order in life by imposing an order upon it.
It is ultimately the function of art in imposing a credible order on ordinary reality. The word credible is very important. We have He has to make us believe in his vision. So ultimately, the function of art in imposing a credible order upon ordinary reality and thereby eliciting some perception of an order in reality is to bring us to a condition of serenity, stillness, and reconciliation. The Christian poet's final purpose. We remember in Ash Wednesday, Eliot saying, I rejoice that things are as they are the poet of the wasteland and the hollow man, bringing himself through his Christian belief to a place where he could say that. Uh, I think we'll stop there and we'll continue and conclude these comments in Eliot's literary and cultural criticism in the next session.